Hello everyone, welcome to EULA TV once, one more time. I am Dr. Mohamed Shipa, I'm an experimental rheumatologist for University College London. And today we are really lucky to have a distinct speaker among us and I don't have to introduce him, it's Professor Lauren Arnold. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure to be here. So first of all, the lupus landscape is changing mm -hmm. and what do you think about that? Oh, I fully, fully agree with you. I think one of the most significant change um, occurring in the last decades is the improvement in the survival of lupus. Uh, before the discovery of corticosteroids, it was a very, very severe disease in all the patients and now survival is incredibly inc improved. It's more like 90%, 95% at 10 years. Uh, but I think uh, this great success hides a few facts that are not so nice, uh, especially the fact that survival in lupus remains poor compared to the general population. Uh, there's a very recent survey from Norway I quoted, uh, the likelihood to die from lupus is multiplied by two uh, if you have adult onset lupus compared to the general population and is multiplied by seven if you have pediatric onset lupus. And I don't think these are acceptable outcomes. And of course we have new drugs being approved, so I, I, I think there are profound changes in, in the landscape. Brilliant, thank you. And what do you think about the use of steroid? I know you have to spoke about, you know, the methylprednisolone pulse versus steroid. Uh, what is the key message you want to give to rheumatologists? Well, I think steroids are the, the best friend, in a way, of both patients and rheumatologists. I mean, it works so well, so efficient, and we have no other possibility, no replacement as, as of today. Uh, but it's always the same, is how do we use them? And I, I think that compared to other diseases, we don't have so many good quality data in lupus to know how to use uh, these corticosteroids. Uh, something increasingly trendy is the use of uh, methylprednisolone infusions based on the so-called um, non-genomic effects. But the literature is not so good, but there are novel papers, new, new things about that. And my guess is that it's going to be used more and more. Absolutely. So uh, next, I would like to ask you about mm -hmm. the lupus research. Obviously, there's so many trials have been oh, faced, yes. and like every day, there is mm -hmm. new in the list. Yep. So, what do you think? Why we are failing? Ah, so uh, you are absolutely right. Um, a 25 um, investigational agents went to phase two or phase three and actually failed. And it's really important for the future to understand why we failed. And um, there are different reasons. In some of the most ancient studies, I'd say it was the use of corticosteroids in large amounts, um, killing the effect of the drug. Mm. But I think that there are true questions about the, the outcomes that we're using, uh, the response index, um, mostly the SRI4, the BICLA. Um, these instruments, they have great properties, but they also have some frailty parts. And there are international collaborations, um, especially led by Eric Morand, trying to develop uh, better instruments for assessing the response, TREM SLE, and I think that's truly an outcome for the future of uh, clinical trials in SLE. Right, okay, yeah, absolutely. So what about, what do you think about the precision medicine? Like, you know, I know you have spoken about yes. like the multi-omics data, mm -hmm. uh, molecular portrait and yep. clinical portrait. Uh, what, is, what is your remark? Uh, I'd be very happy to tell you that uh, precision medicine is almost here, but I would be an enormous liar. I truly believe this is not the case, unfortunately. Um, th there are many biomarkers of interest in the blood, in the urine, sometimes based, tissue based, uh, but this stays in the lab for now. We, we, we have to validate these biomarkers and more importantly, we have to translate them back in the clinical practice. And I believe we are so far from there. So you are absolutely right also saying that I don't think one biomarker is going to work. Obviously it's multi-layer analysis, combining different techniques, that's the future. But I don't think that's for tomorrow. No, oh, absolutely, I agree. Um, now the se next thing is, um, as you have mentioned, lupus probably not one disease. Oh, I'm yes. not sure you will agree. <laughs> yes, yes, no, of course I agree. <laughs> yeah, and then we have seen this increasing amount of paper explaining mm -hmm. the molecular uh, signature of lupus, mm -hmm. like the, some are saying, like the inflammatory lupus versus plasma cell lupus, etc. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that we have to treat them differently in terms of the precision? Uh, it's difficult to say for now, but it, what is sure is that lupus is a very heterogeneous disease um, on all levels, uh, from a clinical perspective, but also from an immunological perspective. And this is why I don't think that one treatment is going to fit everybody um, when you have more um, 
interferon signature, when you are more plasma blast, when you are more on the TH17 side, obviously the treatment somehow has to be different. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think this provides a very strong bond between what we've just been discussing, advanced biomarkers, and the selection of the proper treatment at the patient level. Yeah. That's the future, but we are still far from that. Great. Um, so you spoke, also spoke about chat GPT, lupus yep. GPT, Absolutely. AI, yes. um, which is obviously I'm fascinated about. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of basically uh, AI-generated, patient-oriented um, yes. softwares coming. Absolutely. So what do you, what do you uh, remark about mm -hmm. that? So I think there are several areas of interest. One is to incorporate the patient perspective. Uh, we don't really have the time during a regular consultation. It should be 15 minutes or 20 minutes. But there are tools which would enable a better capture of the patient feedback as, as a way for as a help for us to incorporate that in the care. And I think that's a great direction. But as soon as we are addressing big numbers of people, and Lupus is 3.4 million people in the world, um, we need to use different approaches, such as big data. And I see many, many different uh, applications. It can be early diagnosis through real-time monitoring of a uh, electronic health records, for instance. It can also help in the discovery of biomarkers, trying to find collective trajectories of patients with poor outcome, predicting what at baseline was so predictive of these poor outcomes. And also you highlighted the, the role in patient education. I think something complicated is to provide the patients with quality information. If you go on the web, you will find everything. And it's true that the patient association Lupus Europe has developed a Lupus GPT, which is able to answer in natural language to complicated questions about lupus. And I definitely think that's the future. Well, fantastic. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank and, you very much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think everyone enjoyed that very much. Thank you. And, and, and we have more questions, but I have to stop here because we, we, we will I never stop our question. And, and thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.